anytime we conduct research on human subjects, we have to maintain ethical provisions. However, there are certain groups who are considered vulnerable populations. And when we are doing research on those specific individuals, we have to be extra special, extra careful, and have special provisions to maintain their ethical, ethical rights. So a vulnerable subject is basically anyone who is going to require extra provisions of protections beyond a traditional human subject. Some of them ha are considered vulnerable because they simply cannot make decisions on their own, whether that be because of developmental issues or um, cognitive issues or maybe a combination of both. And others just have a more higher than average risk because of their um, condition, like those who are pregnant because we're not only protecting the pregnant woman, but we're also worried about the, the safety and well-being of the fetus. So let, this is whom your book considers to be vulnerable populations or vulnerable groups. And there's little special caveats for each one of these that we need to think about. First of all, with children, there are legal and ethical issues. Um, depending on the child's age and the state or place of residence, we have to know what the legal age of consent is for our jurisdiction. So for some places it may be 18, for some places it might be 17, sometimes it's if they're medically emancipated. So we need to understand what the laws are for where we do our nursing practice. What if a child is below the age of consent? Um, that means they legally cannot provide consent for any type of research study. It doesn't matter how minimal the risk might be, we cannot proceed if they cannot physically give consent. Their parent or legal guardian must give consent for them. However, your book talks about a special provision called assent, A-S-S-E-N-T, for which we try to use with children. Basically, if you have kids, you know this to be true. Sometimes as adults, we make decisions for kids and they're not happy about it. So as a researcher, if I have a child in, who I want to study who is between 7 and the age of consent, 17 or 18, whatever it may be, then not only do I need to get consent from the parent or legal guardian, but I should also try to get assent, which is a verbal or sometimes written agreement that the child also is willing to participate in the study. It, it's kind of hard to drag kids along kicking and screaming and expect them to be willing participants and give you accurate, unbiased data. So for kids over the age seven or over, we try to do consent from the parents and assent. Um, that way everybody's in agreement. And even if the parent does give consent, if the child says no, we typically as researchers ethically try to avoid including them in the study. Because like I mentioned, you're not gonna get good quality evidence or data from those participants who do not want to be in your study. Um, for mentally or emotionally disabled individuals, there's often a cognitive issue in play in which they legally and ethically cannot speak for themselves and make decisions such as participation in studies. Therefore, we have to know who their legal guardian is and that person would have to give um, consent for their participation in the study. We cannot allow them to consent themselves because legally or ethically they're not able to do so. Um, for severely ill or physically disabled individuals, the same kind of concept um, applies. We have to make sure that um, they can make decisions. Just because someone is severely ill, say end-stage uh, congestive heart failure or renal failure, does not mean they can't provide consent. We just need to sometimes do like a mini mental status exam or some kind of further cognitive testing to ensure that they really know what's going on and can indeed give that informed consent. So that's going to require maybe a little bit of extra effort on the researcher's part. We don't want to assume because we need to maintain their ethical protections for sure. Um, for terminally ill patients, that's a very touchy subject. Um, for someone who is terminally ill, they have some kind of um, disease process going on for which there is no hope of cure. So there's typically going to be very few benefits for their participation in studies. However, often people with a terminal illness want to participate in research to help those who may not have the disease yet or who are at earlier stages. Oftentimes they want to give the other folks 
a chance for a cure. However, we need to be very specific when including them in their studies to let them know that this proposed intervention is not a cure for your disease. We cannot guarantee that your symptoms will improve, nor can we say that we can prevent them from getting worse. So we have to be very specific with the risk benefit um, discussion with those who are terminally ill. Um, institutionalized individuals, that doesn't necessarily mean those in correctional centers alone, though that is a population who is institutionalized. We could also be thinking about those who live in long-term care facilities like nursing homes and things like that. They are institutionalized, um, which means they're kind of like captive audiences. They can't just like leave. Um, and so our, our um, focus there is to make sure just because you're in this prison or just because you're in this nursing home does not mean you have to do this study. We have to extra stress that this is optional. This is totally voluntary. If you say no, nothing will happen to you. We will not punish you in any way, shape, or form. So that's an extra step that we need to make sure happens. And then lastly, for pregnant women, there's a lot more in-depth IRB review um, because we are not, as I mentioned earlier, only worried about the health and well-being of the pregnant woman, but also the fetus or fetuses in the case of multiple pregnancies. So we just have to be careful and anytime you're reading an article about one of these vulnerable populations, the researchers should talk about some of the things that I just mentioned, such as assent or having legal guardians give consent, or sometimes many mental status exams to check the cognitive abilities of people before they give consent. Um, so as you read, make sure you're looking for those types of things to make sure that this was indeed an ethical study and the researchers did everything possible to keep their participants safe.